Hello, everyone. I'm Molly Wood. Welcome to CNET Live at CES. We're here on our CNET stage in the South Hall, right above the Starbucks. If you're watching this live on your phone somewhere in Vegas, get over here. We have a great audience out here, and I'm very excited because right now we have Dan Ackerman and Scott Stein on stage for what we're now calling the our, Laptop Talk Show. The Laptop yes. Talk Show. Our now annual. Our second annual. Yes, our second annual Laptop Talk Show. And the best thing about this is that the drool factor on our stage right now is extreme. Every kind of cool, sexy, gorgeous ultra book that you've been hearing about being announced at the show in blog form is here live on the stage. You guys are basically just going to run through them. And see what And cool. we'll see what sticks. I, I feel like we'll just take the sort of ultrabook approach, right? To the CES. Whole, is the great ultrabook showdown, basically. Throw a bunch of laptops all around. Like shootout. Yeah. It is, yeah. Ultrabook shootout. So let's talk a little bit about that category for the few people who don't know. There may be people watching at home who haven't kind of. I mean, it's actually slightly it's hard. Blurred. It's hard to explain and getting harder to explain, right? What an ultrabook is. Yeah, the category is blurred a bit. So before it was, you know, you had an, it was like a MacBook Air. You know, you've got the flash storage. It's thin, 13-inch uh, laptop, and then you have 11 inches, and now you have 14 and 15 inches, mm -hmm. and some of those have full hard drives, no longer SSDs. Some have optical drives. Some have graphics. So what's the difference? Well, a lot of them are thinner and sexier, um, kind of cooler. They're going to be running those new processors later in the year, right. eventually time to Windows 8. So. So the re-evolution of laptops, really. So, well, the real question for me is why Ultrabooks? Why do you think Intel decided? Because Intel decided, right, let's create this category, let's give it a name, let's everybody get this behind a set of general principles. Because they got to create fads, and the last kind of fad that they were behind was sort of the netbook, where everyone had those Intel Atom netbooks. Right. Those sold well for a while, but then they kind of tapered off. They got to come up with something else, and you know, the term ultra doesn't really mean anything. It means right. like super thin. They could have maybe come up with something more descriptive, but if they can get a fad going behind it, everyone goes, oh, I want a MacBook Air, but I want it to run Windows, mm -hmm. then everybody gets behind it, and next thing you know, you can't buy a thick laptop anymore. Right. Which, which is actually kind of good. Fine really. with me, yeah, yeah, I have no fine problem with that. <laughs> Uh, anybody who didn't get the memo, I have one manufacturer in mind, but it seems like you know we're we're seeing announcements or at least promises from almost anybody. Anyone who's not getting the memo about some Ultra people books? are a little later than others. Uh, Dell, for example, has their first Ultrabook here this week, even though everyone else has had them for a couple of months now. So yeah. at least they're getting into it. Yeah, it seems to like everyone has stepped forward with something. Yeah, oh, I didn't I've see got it. A, uh, there. Hello, our friends from Toshiba have one. Right oh, here. perfect. Okay, yeah. good. As I was in their booth yesterday, thinking. All Everything these laptops looks are really here. big and square, yeah. <laughs> so is it about design, What's the or what is the single most important factor in terms of the the, pro, the value proposition for me, the buyer? What is it that makes an Ultrabook something I need? I think we're so spoiled by carrying things that are thin and light mm -hmm. uh, and, and easy to take with you to work, to home, to the coffee shop. I think that's the key differentiator right there. So it's that's just the, size that's and the weight? Appeal. And I for think me. maybe you want to look at price too because uh, one of the things that you, so unless you're doing something really super cool, and you're going to beat something like the MacBook Air, if you can get a little under that price mm -hmm. and right. offer something where you say, wow, for $899, i am I'm beating it out on specs, and there are some like that. I think it's another thing to look to. That was, for, the, that was yeah. one of the problems with the first Ultrabooks is that they were $1299, $1399, yeah. same price as the MacBook Air, yeah. or even a little bit less, but you can't make something that's just about as good as a MacBook Air and just about as expensive. The thing for me, too, that I, I think has the most promise for consumers is the solid state drives. I think, you know, not everyone has had that, ex that life-changing experience of realizing that when you open your laptop lid, it wakes right up and you can start doing things immediately. Mm -hmm. I feel like when people see that happen, they realize that it means you can just have a laptop anywhere in the house, open it up, start going. I mean, I think that they're that's great. a huge benefit. They run less hot, they may be more reliable, you have less moving parts to break down, but Scott always points out that. I like having a lot of storage, and, I, and maybe I'm old fashioned, but you know, sometimes you want to store a lot of stuff, so I appreciate the movement now that you see a lot of these Ultrabooks that are going to the old fashioned magnetic hard drives. So you're getting up to 500 gigabytes, maybe even a terabyte. I know, it's maybe not. I'm not waiting are, anymore. No some waiting. Some of them are hybrids, you got a little bit of SSD, a little faster right. starting, but yeah, if you, can, if you can deal with the 128 or you want to pay for the 256. But yeah, a lot of people can get a lot of stuff done on those and keep things on the How cloud. long is it going to be before those solid state drives start to come up in capacity at affordable prices? Keep that waiting. seems like that should yeah. be happening, I know, right? Really. Yeah. We're waiting a couple of years. Is there like a law about that? No, well, that's processors. Get, I feel now like you it's not working with Moore's Law now. I know. <laughs> Maybe, I feel like next year should be, this year seems like 128. I'm hoping that next year will be maybe a 256 yeah. standard. But this year you can get a 128 that. for like 799 in yeah. one of these 13 inch ultra books. Yeah. Right. That's a pretty good price. Well, and let's be honest, you can get like a, an external terabyte for oh, sure. 70 bucks these yeah. days, you know, or, a or even network attached network storage tool, yeah. for 100 bucks for a terabyte. <laughs> a stack of I have been, I've been okay with that in my little backup exactly. system. Yeah. All right, let's, enough, enough chatting, enough philosophizing. Yeah. 
Let's get to the Let's porn. Look at some stuff. Let's get to the gadget porn. All right, what do we have? We're going right. to go kind of in order. Right. It looks like you've got three and Scott's got three. I'm going to yep. start go, off go, with, go. The, with the Dell XPS 13. Now, Dell was, of course, a little late to the Ultrabook party. Mm -hmm. They took their time, but they've got a 13-inch system right here that's part of that high-end XPS line. You know, it's super thin. It's not quite as, as super fancy as some of the other ones, but that's because it's sort of meant to be that consumer business hybrid crossover system where you can get it and take it home, but you can also ask your IT department to get it because they have an IT version with like a TPM chip and other stuff like that. And you know, it's got the rubberized bottom if you feel that. That's kind of cool. Oh yeah, that's nice. And it's super thin. And what I like is the footprint is a little bit smaller than some of the other 13-inch Ultrabook. It's, it's closer to what you'd find a 12-inch screen system in. So, so yeah. it's a little bit, it's a little bit more petite, and still super thin. I gotta say too, right off the bat, I am really struck by the similarity to the MacBook Air. They're just really, uh, they're not even pretending not yes. to be making a MacBook Air clone. It really looks like it, and frankly, I consider that a plus. I think everyone stopped pretending in the, in the last couple of months of last did, year. Like, yeah. okay, fine, here it is. And you I'm glad it? they did. I mean, it's you know, it's the perfect size, it's the perfect shape. Get it done. Nice machine. And then we have something a little bit more extravagant. Yeah, now something that does not look like a MacBook Air per se, but uh, no better timing with all the Gorilla Glass talk. Yes. This is the HP Envy Spectre 14, and it is covered in glass. This is Gorilla Glass on the front, it's on the back, also on the palm rest, and on the trackpad. And um, it has a very wow. iPhone 4 type look on that side profile on the lid. And it's, you can see it's heavier, <laughs> it's heavier, it's thicker. It it's is a, heavy. It's a 14 inch, and so that's the beginning of the blurring of the line. It's thinner than there. other Envy's though, and it has the Beats Audio and that little audio analog wheel on the side, like on the new Envy revisions that came out in December. Spectre. I know, nice screen <laughs> and that back of the keyboard, and it's expensive. This is one of those top end ones. This is $13.99. Yeah. It's coming out February 8th. And so this is kind of in that beginning to blur that line in the, in the Ultrabook category. It looks sleek. I mean, I've heard some people ask about the glass. What's going to happen if you... You feel uh, confident having glass on the back of your laptop lid? No I don't way. know. If someone came out with, you with a lance or something, like a sharp object, but I mean, if you drop <laughs> yeah, it... I, that happens. Right. He it, has an exciting life. Home jousting. A lot of jousting. If, um, I mean, if I dropped it, I'd be worried. But honestly, if you dropped any laptop, there would be problems. So right. I don't know. I haven't gone through like dropping laptops on the floor to find out. But I mean, it feels nice and sturdy and sleek, and it's very different than the HP Folio 13, their other Ultrabook, which is in that small business type category. It's kind of the, the no-nonsense, sensible one. It's, and it's also like $8.99. So it's right in that sort of, you know, a lot of specs for your, for your bang for your buck category. And this is that sleeker kind of a design. And I think it's a, probably the single best looking laptop I've seen here this week. It's really, yeah, it's yeah. very beautiful. It's although I'm starting to see design. a lot of fingerprints yeah. already on and the outside it, of that glass. It comes with cotton gloves that you oh, want to handle it with. there you go. It's going to support NFC too. What now, we haven't seen wrong? it in action, but yeah, I know. Cool. All right. That's beautiful. You mentioned our friends over at uh, Toshiba. I did, yeah. Uh, they they need to got, get those. They, they need it's, to it's, just it's blank at the booth ready, with those. It's not quite ready to buy just yet. This is a 14-inch Ultrabook prototype that they have. So you'll see this later in the year, hopefully. And hopefully it'll look just like this. And again, it's got the bigger screen. It's still pretty thin. It's not as thin as those 13 inches. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, we can take that 13-inch Ultrabook and give it a 14-inch screen. Later on, we'll see some 15-inch screens. Mm -hmm. And those become machines that you can use at work all day. A 13-inch Great for traveling, great for that, you know, couple hours at the coffee shop, airport lounge, whatever. But all day, every day, you're not going to use a 13. You need a 14 or a 15. So once you get up to this size, then you have something that's almost as thin and light that you can actually just use as your full-time machine. And that's what Ultrabooks up until now, I think Scott would agree, you have not been able to do. I'm, I feel like I'm skeptical of that, though, the idea that you have to have a 14 or 15-inch machine to work on. Because your hands can't don't you get just tired, have a monitor don't. and a keyboard? Oh, then you got to get like a docking yeah. station and plug stuff in. Who yeah, does that? that's true. I agree. It's clunk. It's a clunkier solution, but it at least for me, it allows me to have a tiny laptop. Uh, I that agree. is true. I don't know if it's, I don't know necessarily where it's going to slot and left to see. I, yeah. I think right now there's not, also, it maybe just go to everybody knows what the MacBook Air is doing, and it's just as simple as that Apple doesn't have a type of product the moment that fits into that That's category. Right. So yeah. people go, oh, wait, I don't, you know, what is that exactly? And there definitely are people who want the keyboard, I think, is a, probably a That's big thing, part of having keyboard. that bigger laptop. Yes. yes. And that real, this is a very Toshiba design sensibility. Yeah. That seems to be what they, you know, you have the differentiating cues, right? The HP Envy line. Very design-centric mm -hmm. machines, right. always have been, really beautiful. Toshiba really does this brushed aluminum. We've seen that on some of their tablets and mm -hmm. some of their other laptops. And then, of course, Dell just looking like a MacBook Air. Now, this Why is not? one of the bigger Ultrabooks, and we also That's have big. one That's of the heavy. smaller Ultrabooks right here that go in the complete opposite direction. Yeah, so the Acer Aspire S5, which had made a lot of waves. I love this one. Acer upped its game with this. This has, I mean, I feel like with the Samsung Series 9 last year, this is kind of like 
inheriting that direction yeah. as opposed to the S3 that was last year that was a, you know, a little more in that grayish silver, not as sexy. This is I mean, we're much more razor thin design, 15 millimeters, mm -hmm. um, onyx black, and it's got that, sp this is the sports car feature of the show. Okay, I love this. Watch, that, this. watch this. Uh, this is the Magic Flip port door. You press the button here oh. and it... It's like a spoiler that comes up automatically. Pops up. It reminds me of a DeLorean or something. And then you have access to all the ports on the back, including Thunderbolt. This is going to be one of those next-gen Ultrabooks. So, so does that mean, it seems like there's weird caginess around Ivy Bridge, right? Didn't you say, yes, okay, yes. so it has Thunderbolt, which means it must have Intel's Ivy Bridge, right? And then what right. happens? Um, nobody wants to talk about it. You say, this is, a this is an Ivy Bridge laptop, right? And they go, hmm. It is a chip, we dare not speak its name. Right, it's yeah. so socially awkward, they just walk away. But it's a clear interfere, it's a good thing. I mean, it's going. I think the more you have Thunderbolt in devices, we talk about Thunderbolt on, on you know Apple mm -hmm. products and how many peripherals do you have, but if it shows up, across a ton of laptops, I think this you'll start one. seeing Thunderbolt peripherals that are kind of interesting. Yeah, I love this sort of the curve, mm -hmm. very Samsung yeah. Series 9, this kind of curved closure there. This is... It feels good. This now, my feels only good, concern yeah, is as soon as you take with this. this little motorized thing here, and that's how they get it so thin by hiding the ports, yeah, make it, it go is again. another mechanical part. That, that you know is, is, that could get something caught in it, or could break it. The more moving parts you have, the more I get worried. But so, and can it you, looks really can you, cool. Yeah. Can you make it come down when the laptop is resting? It, oh, it does. It brings let's the So then it just sort of like apparently. Yes. Let's see what happens. I, I've actually haven't seen this. It's like the sport shocks oh. in Porsche Cayenne. Yeah, look at look that. It's at like a little, that. Right, that's little cool. rising heel. You raise it up. You get a little clearance on your laptop there. I don't know if everybody wants rear ports, but maybe I'm wondering if it's in the future for something like a dock. I'm just guessing. Yeah. But I, you know, some people do like to tuck that Can stuff out of the way. Can you close it up while we have a nice close up here? Mm. There you go. That's ah, hot. Ah, it's totally not going to do that when that but comes to market. But that's one of the ones no that's way. not going to be out until later in the year. Yeah. Right. Uh, maybe with Windows 8. I don't know. Obviously, with whatever the current generation at the time of, of Intel chips. So yeah. uh, a lot of the. Ultrabooks that we're seeing are things you won't be able to get right away. They're going to be like second half of the year, but not really a specified release date. Right. And some of them are right now, which leads to Scott's excellent point that... Uh, yeah, which Ultrabooks are the Ultrabooks and, and what exactly do you find define them as? I mean, I think you've got the first generation, and I think you're also seeing some of these laptops are a continuation of that first generation. But it seems like by the end of the year, you're already going to get that second generation. Right. So you're, it's going to kind of be a bleeding edge. And some of yeah. the ones we're seeing here are kind of like first gen plus, mm -hmm. and other ones are second gen that everyone's not telling the full details. You've got something on. that's coming out soon, but you know that Ivory Bridge and Windows 8 are coming. It's right. maybe out of date in six months, yeah. and yeah. that's kind of the danger. This is like February 8th, and then some of them are like towards the end of the year. And yeah. now Microsoft tried to mitigate, mitigate that a little bit. At least at their keynote, they said all of these devices that you see here are going to be upgradable to Windows 8, which nobody wants to do. I know, do. really. Right. Intel, though, I felt like, at least in their press conference, they were helping nobody out. They yeah. were just like, everything good's happening at the end of 2012. Maybe later. Yeah, it was like I a mean, preview trailer. If you're Dell, right, and you've got this coming out, and you're, the, you're HP, you're thinking like, Look, they thanks have a, a lot. solution for you. The problem is answered. Just buy one now, and then also buy one later. Oh, and then everybody's oh. happy. You see how oh, this all Oh, because you sleep in a bed of money. That's right. Well, oh, see? okay. You've got to wonder what they would like the touch you to do. stuff. You know, are they going to redesign uh, some of the Ultrabooks in the future to be a little more touch compliant, gesture based? Is that going to manifest and will it change designs yeah. a little bit? A right. touch Ultrabook, Scott. Yeah. And I, I am that? intrigued I by the idea oh, of a touch what? Ultrabook. <gasps> if well, only we had one here. If only we had one right here. And this is. Probably one of the more buzzed about products of the show. This yeah. is the Lenovo IdeaPad Yoga, and of course, IdeaPad is Lenovo's consumer product line, and they actually do some really interesting creative stuff there. You may be used to like ThinkPads, which are very kind of buttoned down and sort of business-like, mm -hmm. uh, but I really like the IdeaPads. And as you can see, this guy is already running Windows 8 right. in this uh, kind That's of prototype system that we have here. Looks like a laptop, okay, and you know what? We've seen uh, convertible laptops that turn into tablets. The screen swivels around and folds down. This guy. You take the screen, you fold it back, you keep folding, you keep folding, you keep folding. Oh, it's almost hard to watch, right? Way, because you just back. think you see that hinge breaking, but it's... The first time you open it, it's like a... And there it is. It is, right, exactly. Like, okay, okay, okay. Somehow I've gotten myself into Fruit Ninja, and I don't know how that happened. But I'll you can it. hold it like this, like a tablet. And then you, if you're worried about the keyboard, when you fold it in, the keyboard deactivates. So you're not going to hit any okay. keys by doing that. You just get all the on-screen stuff. Here, give that a feel. Okay. Ooh, that's heavy also. So that's your touch screen there. See, I'm going to, no, this is too distracting. I don't want to play. But that's not, it can also do, it can have other configurations, you can right? Fold that's why they call it the yoga. They, they kind of call it like, it looks like. Right. the tent. I don't know if I ever put it like in that. tent mode. I, would, but, I don't know why you would ever do this. Yeah, yeah. If you have like a little like narrow edge of your table and you want to display like photos or, or something, I don't know. 
I oh, like the. I know exactly why. Oh. Recipes in the kitchen. Yes, or this kind of. Here, I like this around. mode. This sort of makes it like an all-in-one, where you can kind of stand it up like that. Yes, that's nice too. Either of those, like I think, would work for mode. like a yeah. kitchen computer kind of experience. You can take like a yeah. Bluetooth keyboard and sort of set it up like that. That is very that's nice. Fun. You're right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, convertible laptops always come off a bit gimmicky, mm -hmm. although this one definitely seems to have potential for a variety of situations. Well, the problem is that center hinge that rotates is like a weak point, so here you just have two right. regular hinges, so it's not going to wobble back and forth. And the thing that I think is probably the most interesting sort of design element is, if you look right here, there's a little bit of a leathery cover here over the uh, palm rest. Right. So when and you lay it down, it's not going to get super It's just worn. ever so slightly higher than the keys. Mm -hmm. So when you put it down like this, the keys don't actually touch the surface. They're not going to get scratched up. They're not going to get scuffed, and they're not going to accidentally get hit. That's and a good detail. This is another one of the uh, uh, Ultrabooks that's not going to be out till later in the year. As you can tell, it has Windows 8 on it, so we're going to have to wait for that. But uh, I'm how, pretty excited about it. And how confident are you in this one? Because we've seen some idea pad. Vapor right, ones that may not manifest. Issues. This this feels awfully solid. I believe this is. I'm, yeah, I, this this feels. You know. Feels very functional. Yeah, feels very functional. Feels very right. real from looking at it. Um, as far as whether this type of idea takes off, that's a question. But it seems like Windows 8, if it's ever going to be a time to have that convertible tablet laptop that we keep seeing, I feel like, for years, yeah. um, maybe Windows 8 and that, and that UI that's finally more touch-friendly well, might be a time to get into We've that. been testing and reviewing Windows tablets for years before right. the iPad came out, right. and nobody was ever really able to make them work right. No. Uh, the Windows interface just wasn't built for it. Now with Windows 8, at least you have the possibility that they have kind of a touch-friendly interface that people will be able to get into and the hardware will work with. And now, I am a believer in touchscreen laptops and I would be surprised if these Ultrabooks and Windows 8 ended up leapfrogging Apple in that department. What do you think they're going to do? Do you see a touchscreen laptop coming from them anytime soon? That is a good from question. Apple? I don't know. Huh. The answer is continually no, but the answer has been no on them on many fronts for products. But Lion looks an appear. awful lot like iOS or certainly can. It feels like they're yes. moving in a direction where they could get there. They already have that multi-touch interface and gesture interface built in, and they keep experimenting, I feel, with bridging the gap between that and the language of the iPad. They're different, but I, I feel like it's, it seems like it's on, it would be on the way to happen. Yeah. Some it's like those I want big it. touch pads yeah. have been training people to use gestures and touch for years, right. and they just have to take that indoctrination they've been doing and transfer it up here. I was using a, a MacBook Pro a couple of weeks ago, and I'd been using my, my, my uh, iPad a lot, and I found myself absentmindedly just reaching up and trying to scroll down oh, the screen with two time. fingers. I was like, wait a minute. That doesn't work like that. My son yeah. does it all the time. He's, you know, he's super attuned to the iPad usage, and every time he comes to my laptop, he just starts pushing the. But it, it that has become sort of a natural human interface motion. I feel like especially it's with a small laptop, you don't have the gorilla arm problem. Mm -hmm. Right. I feel like it's got to fuse at some point. I mean, it just seems like iOS and OS 10 are are getting to that point. Maybe it's OS 11. You know, is that juncture point? And I feel like Windows 8 is already seeing that and seeing, you know, saying like. Let's just start getting that fusion yeah. going because uh, the devices are going to start bleeding kind together. Kind of surprising that they might get there first, considering the Apple push behind touchscreens. Yeah. So it's yeah. interesting that we didn't plan it this way, but all the laptops on our laptop talk show are Ultrabooks, mm -hmm. and that shows you that I think this is getting to be the super mainstream, and I think by the end of the yeah. year, if your laptop is not this thin, you're just not going to be in the game. You're going to be miserable yeah. is what you're going to be. Like, why am I the only one here with a backache, you know? We need yeah. to talk about the most important trend among Ultrabooks, which is the rise of the dusty pink color. That's clearly Rose the most gold. important trend. I love it. Rose gold ultrabooks. I know this is the Asus so predictable. UX21. They, they, and I feel like um, Samsung Series 9 has one that's all bejeweled as well. They, they, have, well, a, they have a bejeweled bedazzled. one, but they also have that kind of rose gold mm. look, which is yes. actually, that is very like elegant. I really like that a lot. And that's one that came that's out cool. a couple months ago. There's not really anything new about it except for the color, but right. you know, that counts for a lot. Oh, oh, oh right there no, 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 no. See, that's like too far. It looks flesh colored there. I don't like it. That as looks much. flesh colored, yeah. It looks yeah. like there's skin under there. I don't like, like that. It puts the lotion on its skin. That's <laughs> Long not, live the new no. flesh. All but flesh I, but the, uh, the rose gold on the back is really pretty. I like that a lot. Yeah, that, I like that better. All right, so this is an existing product that has now been re skinned. A new color, yes. if you will. <laughs> well, all these are silver. Maybe that's the next step. You get all candy colored uh, Ultra Books. You know, our editor in chief, Lindsay Turrentine, actually has been saying that, that she is hoping that we will actually see a little bit more color on the floor, that that's an area of yeah, customization. Yeah. I feel like there's that a lot of conservatism there's here. There's a lot of, you know, pe right now people do it with cases and Except things like guy. that. But yeah, these, this I know, is but the it's one. Still black. And, and black. Everything else is like shades of gunmetal. I know. Rose yeah. Gold is really standing out. All right, guys, thank you very much for the parade of laptops. Sure. We will, of course, be back next year with another edition of the Laptop Talk Show, and I'm pretty excited. Mm -hmm. Stay right here, though, because coming up, Brian Cooley is taking the stage to talk uh, in depth with a buyer. That is a big part of this show that we often don't talk about, that 
that electronics buyers come here to make long-term purchases for their stores. So we have one of those buyers on stage. I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. A lot of times we only frame CES in terms of what the media is interested in, but this is going to be a great look at, in fact, what what the other function basically of CES, the other function of that show floor. That's coming up. Fitty Stent is going to be on our stage at 2 o'clock. And then we're continuing the celebrity parade with our women in tech panel at 5 o'clock. We have Marissa Meyer from Google, Padma Warrior from Cisco, and then we also have Katarina Fake, who is the co-founder of Flickr and the founder of Hunch. It's going to be a jam-packed day right here at the stage. Don't go anywhere, either on the live stream or, you know, keep your butts on our comfy seats. We'll see you in a little bit.